Hello and welcome to our webinar on dementia. This webinar is based on what we normally deliver to our professional care workers. We've altered it to make it appropriate to you as informal carers. We hope that it provides you with plenty of insight and information and you find it helpful. We always like to define the aims of our webinars. Today our aim is simple, to provide an underpinning knowledge for you as informal carers who support people living with dementia. We also like to be clear about the learning objectives in our webinars. We want to make sure that you know what to expect. For this webinar, we have five basic learning outcomes. Firstly, understand what dementia is. Secondly, know the most common types of dementia and their causes. Thirdly, identify some common symptoms of the condition. Fourthly, understand key features of the theoretical models of dementia. And lastly, consider factors relating to an individual's experience of dementia. So, what is dementia? Dementia is a condition that affects the brain and mental capacity, leading to the disruption of an individual's life, including the ability to manage daily tasks, forgetfulness and memory loss, communication impairment, an awareness of own, one's own behaviour, reasoning and judgement, it's also a term used to describe a range of symptoms. There are many types of dementia and each individual will be affected in their own unique way. There is now a better understanding and awareness of the condition, enabling a better quality of care, support and services available. There are some things that it is important to remember. Memory difficulties do not necessarily mean dementia. Dementia is now the leading factor of death in the UK, but people can live well with the condition. Let's look at the common forms of dementia. And remember, dementia is a syndrome rather than the disease itself. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, first described by the German neurologist Alois Alzheimer as a physical disease affecting the brain. During the course of the disease, plaques and tangles develop in the structure of the brain, leading to the death of brain cells. These affect the messaging in the brain by reducing some important chemicals. These chemicals are involved with the transmission of messages within the brain. Alzheimer's is a progressive disease, which means that gradually, over time, more parts of the brain are damaged. As this happens, the symptoms become more severe. The deterioration is often described as a gradual slope. On this slide you can see two cross-section slices of the brain, one healthy and one with Alzheimer's. The second most common type of dementia is vascular dementia. It is caused by problems in the supply of blood to the brain. Brain cells need a good supply. Blood carries the oxygen and glucose to the brain cells and this is delivered through a network of blood vessels called the vascular system. If the vascular system within the brain becomes damaged and blood cannot reach the brain cells, the cells will eventually die as they are starved of their vital food and this can lead to the onset of vascular dementia. The damage can occur through a narrowing of blood vessels, this is called small vessel disease, and is the most common form of vascular dementia. Or it could be caused by a stroke or a cardiovascular attack or by multiple mini-strokes or transient ischemic attacks, also known as TIAs. This type of dementia is called multi-infarct dementia. The progression of vascular dementia is often described as a step deterioration because there are plateaus and often sudden drops down. Dementia with Lewy bodies, or DLB, is the third most common type of dementia. DLB shares symptoms with both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Frederick Louis, a colleague of Alois Alzheimer, identified tiny deposits of protein inside nerve cells. It's not understood why Louis bodies appear in the brain or exactly how they cause dementia. What is known is their presence is linked to a low level of important chemical messengers and to a loss of connections between nerve cells. Over time, there is a progressive death of nerve cells and a loss of brain tissue. People with Lewy body dementia fluctuate physically and cognitively within a day, hour to hour, 
even minute to minute. Frontotemporal dementia, including Pick's disease, is one of the less common forms of dementia. The word frontotemporal refers to the two lobes of the brain that are damaged in this form, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. Frontotemporal dementia is caused when nerve cells in the frontal and or temporal lobes of the brain die and the pathways that connect them change. There is also some loss of important chemical messengers. Over time, the brain tissue in the frontal and temporal lobes shrinks. Frontotemporal dementia is most often diagnosed between the ages of 45 and 65, but it can also affect younger or older people. This is considerably younger than the age at which people are most often diagnosed with the more common types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease. You might be interested in the prevalence rates of dementia. Alzheimer's disease, over 60% of cases. Vascular disease, 15%. Mixed dementia, which is most commonly Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease, 10%. Dementia with Lewy bodies, 10 to 15%, and frontotemporal dementia, 2%. So, what are the risk factors for dementia? As you would expect, there are multiple risk factors, including your age, lifestyle, including things such as smoking, drugs, diet and alcohol, learning disabilities, your mental health, genetics and other conditions such as stroke, diabetes and Parkinson's disease. And dementia is not entirely a disease of age. It's been estimated that there are over 40,000 young people with dementia in the UK. Diagnosis at an early age can be incredibly difficult. People require different services to those who are older. People may be of working age at the time of diagnosis. They may have dependent children. They might have financial commitments. They find it harder to adjust to losing skills. And they can find it more difficult to access support. Let's have a look at diagnosis. Early diagnosis is important and allows a person the ability to make preparations for the future. There are a number of ways in which dementia is diagnosed. They are the Mini Mental State Examination, the MMSE. That's the most commonly used test for dementia and is also used to assess whether medication is appropriate. There are blood tests, a CT scan or computerised tomography, an MRI scan or magnetic resonance imaging, a PET scan, positron emission tomography and EEGs. There is a clear pathway that has been set out by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. You may recognise this process or indeed may be involved in it. It begins when a person is suspected of having dementia. There is then an initial assessment in non-specialist settings where a decision will be made to refer for a diagnosis in a specialist diagnostic service. There will then be further tests for dementia subtypes, referral and support after diagnosis, and then management. I do want to say something about confusion. There are conditions that may cause symptoms of confusion similar to that of dementia. Just because someone is confused, it does not necessarily follow that they are developing dementia. Their confusion could be caused by infection, dehydration, constipation, the side effects of medication, stress, anxiety or some emotional states, and depression. Delirium and depression are cognitive disorders with impaired memory, thinking and reasoning and can be confused with dementia, but all have devastating effects on the ability to function in daily life. So, what are the signs of dementia? Again, there are multiple signs. They could be memory loss, disorientation, poor concentration, thought processing difficulties, mood changes, self-neglect, increased walking, weight loss or weight gain, perception changes, sensory loss, depression, incontinence, behavioural changes, repetitive behaviours, being prone to falls or communication difficulties. I'm just going to explain in very simple terms the working of the brain. You can see in this slide the different parts of the brain and the tasks the different parts fulfil. Coloured in blue is the frontal lobe, which is the management centre of the brain and responsible for executive functioning. It helps us to plan, to risk assess, 
gives us motivation, gives us our social skills. Damage to this area can cause difficulty with tasks such as shopping, cooking and finances, an appearance of lethargy and laziness, disconnection from those around them, repeating words or repeating an action such as folding, and a lack of inhibition and appearing self-centred. Coloured in yellow is the parietal lobe. This is the ordering and structuring lobe. It helps us to interpret our special awareness and recognising where our limbs are in relation to the rest of our body. It helps us with sequencing such as getting dressed or reading, writing and mathematics. It is our sense of touch. Damage to this area of the brain can cause difficulty with recognising heat and cold, such as not wearing appropriate clothing, walking, picking up objects, putting clothes on in the right order, working out change, stopping reading and writing or missing out on letters, and remembering things such as passcodes. Coloured in red is the occipital lobe. This is the pathway to the eyes, helping us to interpret how we see. Damage to these areas, for example, can cause visual disturbances such as hallucinations, seeing dark mats or shadows as holes, and finding it difficult to see white food on white plates. In the grey is the cerebellum. This assists with coordination, balance, muscle tone and control of voluntary movement. Damage to this area can cause tremors, lack of coordination and the inability to judge distance. It can also cause weak muscles. Attached to the cerebellum is the brain stem. This plays a role in our vital functions, such as our heart rate, blood pressure, swallowing, digestion, temperature levels and our ability to sleep. Damage to this area might cause difficulty swallowing, dizziness and nausea, sleeping difficulties, increase in infections, constipation and breathing. Finally, in green is the temporal lobe. This is the knowledge bank where we store information about words and their meanings, our emotional and factual event memories. It helps us to recognise people, directions and landmarks. Damage to this area can cause us difficulty in remembering names and faces and objects, lead us to become lost or disorientated in familiar places, and have difficulty in understanding spoken words and using formal language. Within the temporal lobe are the hippocampus and the amygdala, one on each side. The hippocampus is the area of the brain that Alzheimer's disease generally starts in. The hippocampus manages our factual memories that we store in order of time so that we can recognise childhood events for what they are. The amygdala is our emotional memory and it helps us recall events due to the emotional content such as the loss of someone special, the birth of a child, a wedding or a civil partnership. The amygdala is also stimulated by our senses, particularly our sense of smell and hearing. Our strongest event memories tend to be between the ages of 5 and 30. This is because they tend to be our first. The hippocampus is also responsible for our concentration, our logic and reasoning. It takes our short-term memories and places them into the long term. If we have things on our mind or we are juggling several things, we are often not paying attention and this is why we can forget appointments or forget what we have entered a room for. The hippocampus protects the amygdala, so this receives less damage until much later on in a person's dementia. Because of this, the brain may rely on the amygdala to find an event from the emotional past. So often when things are becoming unfamiliar to a person with dementia, they might ask to go home or ask for their mother. The deterioration in memory in people with dementia can have a number of different effects on their behaviour. If they develop dysphasia, they will have reduced language abilities, speech, reading and writing. Dyspraxia means that they cannot do things or certain movements on command or by copying others, such as getting dressed or writing. Agnosia means they cannot recognise familiar things such as a pencil, a chair or people. There can also be a disturbance in executive functioning, doing things in certain orders, for instance, dressing. Let's have a look at the psychological needs of people with dementia. 
Professor Tom Kitwood, a leading pioneer in dementia research and understanding, once said that once you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. And that's incredibly true. People with dementia do not just have medical needs. Even though a person with dementia is losing some abilities, their psychological needs still must be met. They have needs for love, they have needs for comfort, attachment, inclusion, identity and occupation. This is because dementia is not just medical. The purely medical model of dementia has undergone some criticism. That it creates dependency, restricts choice, disempowers, devalues, reinforces stereotypes and can be thought of as oppressive. The medical model focuses on the impairment as the problem and looks to find a cure. The social model of dementia is different. This is person-centred, focusing on the rights of the individual and in turn empowering the individual, promoting independence, giving choice and looking at what the individual is able to do. The key is, of course, to take a person-centred approach. What does that mean exactly? Well, it's about thinking about the individuals, about their identity, about their choice, about their privacy, their dignity, their independence, their rights and their culture and traditions. It's about working together for the individual, involving family, friends, advocates, health professionals and care or support staff. It's about assisting to maintain existing relationships and create new ones. I want to mention some of the environmental factors that need to be considered when caring for a person with dementia. You need to consider the familiar, personal possessions and things in the home. You need to consider things that make sense, that offer signs and predictability. You need to think about noise, both inside and outside. About stimulating activities, things to do and things to look at. But also about calming things, such as colours. You need to look at safety, access inside and out, trip risks and stairs. You need to think about floors, whether that be the colour or the type of surface. You need to look at predictable things and make it things that make sense, that offer cues and signs. In these last few slides, I want to talk a little bit about supporting people with dementia. Clearly, communication is a really important part of this. For that reason, it's well worth taking some time to think about how you communicate. For many of us, we think it is all about the words that we use. But the reality is that the words we use really only make up about 7% of the communications message. The tone of the message is vitally important and our body language even more so. So when you're next communicating, think about your tone and body language at least as much, if not a lot more so, than the words you're using. It's also important to think about our attitudes and behaviours. To quote the Dalai Lama, our actions create either suffering or happiness. Positive interactions promote and prolong happiness and positivity and will increase well-being. Neutral and negative interactions increase the likelihood of a negative mood state and may lead to ill-being. And finally, think about how you're responding. Show you're really listening. When there's an opportunity, speak in a calm manner and tone, being careful not to be patronising. Try not to take things said personally. Know that the person is upset, not with you, but with their understanding of what is or is not happening. And try not to argue, criticise or blame or tell the person off. Thank you for listening. We do hope you've enjoyed this webinar on understanding dementia and we hope that it's helped you in some way. If you need more information or more support, please do contact us 